Hi, ActiveHistory.ca is happy to present a recording of Megan Davies and David Ravel's presentation, Locating Parkdale's Mad History, Back Wards to Back Streets, 1980 to 2010. Their talk is part of the History Matters lecture series sponsored by the Toronto Public Library. Check out the podcast section of ActiveHistory.ca for recordings of other talks from the History Matters lecture series. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, it's a real pleasure to see you all, and it's a delight for us to be part of the Toronto Public Library History Matters series. And I hope you'll all let the Toronto Public Library know that they should do more of this kind of stuff. So um, our technical advisor, Bryn, is going to give us the next slide. Thank you. And this is the slide by which we introduce ourselves. And I'm, of course, standing in the way of you over here. So I'll stand over here. Um, I'm David Revel. I'm a psychiatric survivor. I teach Mad People's History at Ryerson University. And during the early 80s, I was on city council. And I can tell you that Parkdale was on every single agenda for the five years I was there. <laughs> Dr. Davis. OK, um, I'm Megan Davies. And I teach in the Health and Society program at York University. Um, my connection with madness is my involvement with the History of Madness in Canada website which has taken over my life uh, over the last few years, and um, more particularly with a, a large national project about the history of deinstitutionalization in Canada. Thank you. Um, and in case we forget, um, before you leave, I hope you'll pick up one of these sheets of paper, which is some uh, resources that we will have been mentioning during the talk. Uh, they're, they're all web-based resources in the main including the very important History of Madness in Canada website that has taken over Megan's life. <laughs> and her children do not thank her for it. But nonetheless, bring will advance to Could the next Could you give us slide. another slide? Okay. So we're just going to start off very quickly with a couple of slides about term terminology that we're going to be using in this talk. And the first is to just say that we use the term madness um, and why? Well, because we like the word madness because it isn't a biomedical wor word. It, it includes uh, social, socio kind of cultural elements and it focuses our, our attention on who we think are the central actors in the story, mad people themselves. And we also like the word madness and mad, those words because they're provocative. They claim, reclaim uh, an, what has been used as a negative label as something that, that uh, has more action in it. Um, okay. Thank you. Next slide. Um, sometimes we will talk about people in these terms. We might say psychiatric survivor. And let me just explain where those kinds of terms come from. Uh, and it relates to the idea that you have. If your idea is pathology, as in medicine, uh, you tend to talk about patients and illness. If your idea is in rehabilitation, you tend to talk about clients and disability. And if your idea is a self-help notion, that is, people with similar interests coming together to work on shared issues, you talk about members, you talk about ex-patients, you might talk about ex-inmates and, uh, more recently, surviving. So that's where that terminology comes from. Slide. So this is a story about uh, people like these. And these people are real people, but in a way they are metaphors. So the woman on the left with the hat is Pat Capone. And she was one of the people who was dumped in Parkdale, at least that was how it was described, uh, discharged from psychiatric hospital and sent to Parkdale to live in a rooming house. Uh, the two people in the top right are Paul Quinn and Reva Gerstein. 
Uh, Paul Klein and Reva Gerstein are two of the professionals who sought to assist people like Pat uh, with uh, creating better living conditions. And the person in the bottom right is uh, a metaphor for, uh, that happens to be a politician named Tony Ruprecht, and uh, they were people who criticized the government for dumping people in Parkdale. They, they were singularly ineffective in that respect because, of course, the people were already dumped and the government didn't come and collect them back. Um, next slide. Uh, did we miss our movie? I have no, the movie's, coming, the the movie's coming up at, in a minute. Is this my turn still? Yeah. This is, this is Pack a Pony, again. And she was sent to live in Shannon Court, which was a humongous privately operated rooming house near King and Dufferin. Uh, and uh, it was pretty horrific there for her. And uh, for a couple of years, she kind of hid in her room. Uh, but then she decided she needed to get out of that place. So she thought she'd better get out into the neighborhood and walk around and try and see what else was going on in Parkdale. And one day she came to the Parkdale Library. And on uh, the notice board, she saw a notice for a public meeting. And it turned out the public meeting was about her and people like her. So she went to the meeting. And uh, at the meeting, people were complaining about the weirdos that had appeared in the neighborhood. Uh, and uh, after a while, she couldn't take it any longer. She was sitting right at the back because she wanted to be able to get out if it was too horrific. So she stood up looking more assured than I felt, and I tried to conceal my shaking. I identified myself as one of the nuts they'd been discussing. I said that I objected to being spoken of as garbage. And uh, Victor Willis. Hi, Victor. <laughs> And uh, this, this, of course, is all in Pat's book, uh, which is called Upstairs in the Crazy House, and it was published in 1992 by Penguin. Um, it was the first time a survivor had secured a big mainstream publisher like Penguin, and it tells the story of living in that particular boarding and lodging house right here in Parkdale. We, we, by the way, have a, a little display of resources here that you're welcome to look at afterwards. Well, uh, David's been focusing just right now on Pat's kind of famous moment and her book, but there are many mad moments and much mad history in Parkdale. Um, I think it's fair to say that Parkdale is more connected with madness in the post-institution era than any other neighborhood in Toronto. And as David referenced, for some, this is a story about the creation of community. For others, a tale about threats to personal safety, perceived or uh, threats to property values. Um, but the common thread in this story that we're telling tonight is about impact and reaction. And we have, next is the archway clip. We have okay. a little clip that so, David will explain. Yeah. Um, oh, no, we, back. This, this actually is uh, yeah. going to go in this machine. Let me just explain what this is. Uh, we retrieved a Betamax tape from the Ham H archives, which is sort of like a training video, and it's a Ministry of Health video about Archway. And I just want to play a couple of minutes of it. It's, it's a pretty revolting video, frankly. But the first couple of minutes are, are good because it describes the, the neighborhood, in case some of you don't know it well enough. And I think it's from the late 80s? Mid 1988. 1988. And so uh, Archway would have been in operation for about 12 years by this time. Archway it was a community... Uh, service uh, community outpatient clinic still is and uh, is not happening for some oh. wait a minute we have to oh there we go 
Do we, uh, have, do we have sound? We may not have sound. Just hum. There's some music. Da 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 da. People walking down the street. Here we are, village of Parkdale. It's describing that uh, Parkdale used to be a very elegant neighborhood, but uh, I, oh, here's the elegant part. <laughs> and then it describes uh, getting up into the 60s. The Gardner Expressway has been pushed through, cutting Parkdale off from the lake. And those big houses are now being turned into rooming houses. Even, even beautiful houses with turrets like that. And here is the cent uh, what was then called the Queen Street Mental Health Center began to discharge patients into the community because there were pills like chlorpromazine that were meant to manage your symptoms didn't help you learn how to cook, however. And here's the Archway Clinic that's being opened as a one of the very earliest community mental health outpatient clinics, and that's enough. Okay. So we've located our story in what we see as a series of pivotal Parkdale spaces and places. So we're going to be looking tonight at Archway a little bit more. Um, at the Parkdale Activity Recreation Center, House Link, and talking a little bit about the Cuckoo's Nest uh, publication. These, Can you give us a new slide, Brent? Oh yeah, the next slide, Brent. Sorry about that, Brent. These are temporal and physical spaces that emerged over the 1970s and 80s, and we see these as radicalized spaces, stigmatized spaces, safe spaces, medicalized spaces, therapeutic spaces, all of them unique spaces infused with the politics of deinstitutionalization. Um, but, and they're Parkdale, but their politics, the politics behind their creation and their embodied activities have a broader significance because they represent the shape that community mental health took in that in the post asylum era not just in Parkdale but in cities across Canada and communities across Canada okay I think the next slide Bryn. okay I want me to do this Pete or are you still going no you're gonna you're gonna talk about trans institutionalization okay um, so in, in the late 20th century uh, a broken public policy played out right here in Parkdale. And the broken public policy was to discharge people into the community who had not lived in a community for many years with a welfare check and a pill. And it just didn't work. Uh, and the community was not at all prepared for this to happen. So some people in the community just wished that those mad people would go away. And some other people in the community said, okay, what is it that we can do to try and make uh, inclusion possible uh, under these circumstances? Um, so Megan and I's inclination is to try and foreground mad people when we do this work. But as we looked through the fabulous collection of clippings that the Parkdale Library has, and we are very grateful to librarians past for creating these wonderful scrapbooks about Parkdale. Uh, we discovered that the loudest voices were politicians, social workers, healthcare professionals, uh, people of uh, goodwill, and that the mad voice was somewhat muted. And in fact, uh, Pat Capone was very successful at getting the press interested in what was going on here. So she had Betty Jane Wiley pretending to be a mad person living in a boarding and lodging house for, what, nine days? And she wrote a five-piece series for the star. And then she got Jojo Chinto from City TV to pretend he was a mad person. And he went and lived in a boarding and lodging house and uh, covered it on the television. But so we were tending to hear from broadcasters and not so much from mad people. 
but looking at the documents, you can start to see that connections were being made between uh, the Cuckoo's Nest, which was a newsletter that Pat Capone was the editor of, between Park, Parkdale Activity Rec Center, just down the street at 1499, uh, at Archway, and uh, House Link and Parkdale Community Legal Services. Then <laughs> No, Bryn, just stick it. Just uh, stay there. Stay there. Okay. This is like a team here. I know. <laughs> Three, exactly. And the team doesn't practice. <laughs> Not We're going to do this talk immediately again after it's over. It will be much better. We, we just hired Bryn two minutes before we started. Okay, so make sure I'm, you check what the pay is actually. <laughs> I just want to do the bigger picture historian thing for a minute here. Um, as many, as most of you know. During the latter half of the 20th century, mental health care experienced this transformative shift. Um, as patients were released from long-stay mental health facilities and moved out into the community. This is deinstitutionalization, and it, of course it wasn't just a Canadian story, it was a transnational phenomena following the Second World War. Um, what we've been finding through our deinstitutionalization project is that there's considerable regional variation in terms of timelines across Canada, but in most, case, most places it's a story of the late 60s and really more of the 1970s. Yeah, deinstitutionalization was attractive um, because it was, it was widely thought that institutions weren't working, they were chronically overcrowded, chronically underfunded. The, the uh, national health and welfare state was being put into place in Ottawa and the money was going to other places. So there's a real push from the 1950s on to reform Canada's mental health system. And as David mentioned, with the introduction of new pharmaceutical treatments in the, the 1950s, there was this promise that patients would be able to manage their symptoms in the community. Um, and I, I think there's another argument that I'm just going to push in here too, which was this hum humanistic um, perspective that saw social integration of mental health patients um, along with other marginalized pe peoples as aspects of an emerging rights-based society here in Canada. So there's growing attention to the civil rights of mental health patients um, by the 1970s. So th this is a complicated story and I've left out five other perspectives I could have thrown in. But each one of these impulses is played out in Parkdale as, it, as they were in other places across Canada. Does anybody love MapQuest like I do? You love MapQuest? Yes, so thanks to MapQuest I have an aerial view of the neighborhood, and if I had my pointer, which I do have, I could point at some things. Um, so Parkdale happened to be conveniently or inconveniently located between two asylums. Uh, one in uh, the Lakeshore, the one at Kipling and uh, the Lakeshore, and another asylum just over here, which of course was the Provincial Lunatic Asylum built in 1850. And uh, the, when Queen Street downsized in 1975, uh, hundreds of people were discharged. Uh, when Lakeshore was closed in 1979, everybody was discharged. And look what happened to them. Some of them were sent to Hamilton, some of them were sent to Whitby, some of them came to Queen Street, and many of them went no one knows where. Um, and there's a curious verb used by health facility planners called decanting, which is sort of something that most of us think you do with wine. But when you're emptying a hospital, that's called decanting as well. So, oh, and by the way, this is a lovely picture postcard of the Lakeshore site. It looks sort of like a university, doesn't it? Um, but it wasn't. Um, 
This phenomenon is usually called deinstitutionalization. I think a better description of it is transinstitutionalization, because what happened was people were institutionalized in a big asylum, and then they were split up and sent to be transinstitutionalized in crummy boarding and lodging houses. And they, in fact, were less well managed in most cases than the asylum. And maybe that's all I need to say about that. Okay, so um, in the, the, the asylum is an artifact of the mid-19th century, and it had about a hundred year run. And people who went into the asylum weren't expected to come out again so much. Uh, when you start closing the asylum, you then need a community response to people with mental health problems, and it didn't really exist uh, until long after they closed the asylums. Uh, so there was a huge planning error or neglect or deliberate uh, made uh, in about the mid-70s. Uh, however, uh, one of the attempts to start to develop community mental health services was Archway, which uh, many of you walk by uh, every day here in Parkdale. And... Uh, it was the product of quite a lengthy planning process that included community people, uh, included people who worked at the Queen Street Mental Health Center. And uh, this is actually uh, an issue of uh, the cuckoo's nest in which they're criticizing Archway. Uh, what year is that? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. 1984. So Archway had been there for about eight years by then. And uh, what, what happened at Archway was they had a multidisciplinary team uh, and a very large number of outpatients, most of whom were diagnosed with schizophrenia. Uh, was I going to say a lot more about that? No, I think that's good. Okay. Because um, I'm going to say more about Archway. Oh, good. So Archway... Um, is, as, as David indicated, represents the emergence of psychiatry um, from the asylum. Previously, psychiatrists had worked in institutions, but after 1950, um, they came out of institutions because they were establishing uh, psychiatric wards in general hospitals here in Canada. Um, psychiatrists were building up private practices, and they were starting to, and in the 1970s, they started to work in community uh, outpatient clinics like Archway. So I, therefore, or we, therefore, read. We, therefore. <laughs> read. Do proclaim. <laughs> that, that when we think about Archway, it's, it's a really interesting shift for psychiatry because it's kind of like you would think of it as sort of an outpost of, of psychiatry, uh, you know, like a medicalized space that's being transported from the institution and relocated in the community. And certainly this is a, Archway is a good example of trans-institutionalization or de-mental hospitalization. Um, but when Archway, I also see Archway out in the community as being having to orientate itself in into two directions at once. So towards the uh, Queen Street Mental Health uh, Center, but also towards the community. And as David pointed out, it was a locale for a much more diverse set of mental health professionals to ex so uh, professional expansion, including social workers and psychologists. Um, who taught these life skills that David was talking about. Um, and just to reference one particular individual whose career path I find quite interesting, social worker Bob Rose worked for three and a half years at Archway in the mid-1980s, around the time when, when this uh, cover was done. And he was part of an innovative case management team that didn't expect patients to come to work with him in his office, but he would go out and meet with them in boarding houses and on the streets. Um, oh, in reach. In reach, thank you. Um, 
And what's a, another illustration of the connective nature that we found of Mad Parkdale is when Rose left Archway, he just moved down the street to work at Parkdale Activity Recreation Center. And what's interesting, I think, about Bob, though I haven't asked him about this, but that I think that working at Archway was a politicizing experience for him. And at a certain point, he decided that, that he was no longer comfortable at Archway, so he moved to a different kind of work with, within the Parkdale community. And I think that this is, therefore, his case illustrates how Parkdale could be a politicizing space and experience for health professionals, including Reva Gerstein and probably Paul Quinn in that. Okay, um, slide 10. Now we're going to talk about Park. Okay, <laughs> and the executive director of Park is here, Vic Willis, is right there. Good to see you, Vic. Um, so the you start to, to detect in the, in the um, archives some chat about getting Park going in the mid-70s. And it seems to take forever for people to get this plan off the ground. But the idea was, was that there were so many ex-psych patients in Parkdale who had no living room that perhaps an organization could be created that would be like a living room for them. And uh, I, I don't know whether that was really in the minds of everybody who worked on inventing park. Uh, but it certainly, when I go to park, it certainly feels sort of like a living room. And it opened in 1980. So that means that this year, park will be celebrating its 30th Anniversary, and that one of the things it's going to do for the 30th anniversary is a thing called the Living Archive Project. And is that what you were working on with those interviews? No. No. That's no. something else. But the, but it's happening at Park. Okay, it's going to happen at Park. Actually, David said uh, it'll be up by the end of the week. Uh, there'll be five videos on YouTube that are one of the uh, components of the Living Archive Project. Cool. Yeah, very cool. So. And what will their title be? How do we find them? One of them is called Amy Spike. Um, there are various links. Um, and, I'll and if we went on the park website, could we find the links? I wish that was the case. Okay, <laughs> don't go there. <laughs> call Megan at home 24 7. <laughs> <laughs> okay, call Park and they'll tell you. So it was in the Lakeside Pool Hall in Bowling Alley, and it had four staff. I think the budget was $20,000 a year. Um, and by a curious irony, it was furnished with furniture that was thrown out when the Lakeshore Psych Hospital closed. <laughs> now that's making an organization out of scraps, right? Um, the community volunteers, this is what it said in the paper, they found that Parkdale had a very high proportion of socially isolated and unsophisticated people, including ex-psychiatric patients, alcoholics, transients, and unemployable. We, we got that out of the Enviro News Express, right? Mm -hmm. 1977. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Uh, early on, the composition of the park board shifted to include members, so that half of the board were members of the organization and the other half were community allies. It was one of, I would, I would think it was the earliest drop-in of its kind in Toronto, uh, and there was an acceptance of difference at park, including mad behavior. It appeared that uh, quite soon, by 1981, uh, the director of park is uh, beginning to become a public advocate for mad people. And is, uh, listen to this, uh, people trying to live on welfare payments of $258 a month. And uh, no legal protection for boarders who did not have exclusive use of their own space or a lock on their door. La la la, la la la. Pacaponi started working there 
1984, we think. And other things that you might say. But, Bryn, I have a lot of slides from... Oh, maybe it's your turn. It's oh, your turn. Okay, I, I guess the one thing that... Give us, give us the next slide. Yeah, give us the next slide, Bryn. Okay, so um, if David had gone along with my plan for printing things up in 18-point font, because then you can really read it even when you're aging. Um, I guess the one thing that I might add to what you said was that um, I think what we saw from the documents that we, we gleaned about Park is it started out, the earliest dir direction of Park was kind of set in this sort of social work, social services rubric, kind of life skills programming for these um, unsophist unsophisticated people. But there's a shift fairly early on with PARC to a much more member-centered organization. And I'm going to give you a quote from Paul Quinn, who started working there, um, I think, in 1981. Uh, we didn't put ourselves as staff above the people. We felt we were part of them, that this was their place, and we were just put there to help them make it their place. And with Paul there from 81 and, and uh, Pat Capone coming in and Paul wasn't a health professional that's not where he was coming from and Pat was a survivor and both of them were coming from much more human rather than professional perspective and I think there that that resulted in it in a direction for Park that I think is significant also because Park missed out on the local initiative projects the LIP and the LEAP grants they just had no money, as you pointed out. And so I think what's interesting is they obviously had to rely on the support and help, help of members. I mean, Paul told me he ran drop-ins all by himself when he started there. Um, and these weren't small drop-ins. So he had to count on the support of members. So I think that also lack of funding in a sort of quirky way gave members more uh, um, more involvement more m more power at park um, okay so park was not ever a medicalized space um, they never distributed medication there there were drop-ins at at the archway that were connected with a more medicalized model um, and I would argue I argue and David doesn't entirely agree but that's okay I argue that over time, Park emerged as a kind of therapeutic space for consumers, for survivors within Parkdale, a place where they had ownership, where they were, they felt safe, um, a community, and a, a place for them to be not uh, mental health patients, but artists, um, cooks, uh, political activists, and and writers. Um, as, as David said, it was a kind of living room. Um, and the book on the right of the screen is Kiss Me, You Mad Fool, which was published in 1991. And it, was, it came out of the long-term park writing group, which um, began kind of in a sporadic fashion in about 1985 and eventually co coalesced into a sort of set time space and process of about seven or eight people getting together, I think, on Fridays, and they have coffee, and a couple of guys would run across the street, I like this part, and get a selection of chocolate bars um, <laughs> from the shop over there. Crispy crunch. A selection. Oh, so like, it would be okay. liquid for flavors. They don't make that anymore. And, and they all distribute pens and pads of paper, and they'd set an exercise and write for a specific amount of time, and then everybody would read everybody else's work and, and discuss it. Um, and I think, do we, we have... have slide pictures of all the writers that are represented in Kiss Me You Mad Fool. Bryn, could you just uh, go relatively slowly through? Uh, there's eight of them and uh, the next eight, including, look, Pat Capone with a different hat. Uh, and the next eight, oh, there's four. And then the next eight and the final eight. Uh, and 
Do you know how to find previous slide? Good. Would you go back to the very first one that has this on it? She's smart. It's a good hire. <laughs> I'll tell you, what, what everybody needs is a young fella to help them. Um, I did, I have in my hand, as we used to say in the legislature, the final report of the Gerstein Task Force on Discharge Psychiatric Patients. Uh, and that is the cover of it. And I, I just wanted to point out that there were three regular people on the advisory committee. Pat Capone, uh, another fella from Park, and a man from another survivor group from the East End called On Our Own. And uh, um, in my business of trying to uh, understand the MAD movement, this was a early example of consumer participation where somebody with lived experience of something is invited to be part of a committee that figures out what to do about something. And it's a credit to the Dr. Gerstein and uh, Mayor Eggleton that that happened. Um, because as far as I can tell, it was a very early example of public policy being developed in part by mad people. Uh, very important moment, uh, 1983-4. Currently, it, the most important and most critical issue facing people whose lives have intersected with the mental health system is housing. And it's no surprise that when David and I went into the newspaper clipping files upstairs in this library, that the fattest files were the ones about housing. They were full of newspaper clippings and um, other pieces from the 1970s onwards about housing in Parkdale. So, Park and, and, and Parkdale was the place in the media eye about housing for marginal people in Toronto, for sure. Um, partly because it had this available housing stock, as you had mentioned, um, these, the larger uh, houses that you saw in the archway sequence about, about Parkdale that had been broken up into rooming, rooming houses. Um, and, 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 and it was widely acknowledged that, um, that Parkdale had, had problems with their housing stock, that there was a lot of inferior housing, um, and that these were pretty miserable places for a lot of people who'd, um, who'd been institutionalized. Uh, the 19, in 1981, Phoenix Rising, the psychiatric survivor newspaper that came out of Toronto, uh, had a theme issue on housing, and in the editorial it focused on Parkdale. And I quote, over 1,000 poor ex-patients are being dumped and ghettoized in disgraceful boarding homes in Parkdale. So this was late 70s, early 80s, but by the mid 80s, the, the rooming houses were shutting down because there was starting, I guess, starting with gentrification. And so there was a different kind of housing crisis emerging in Parkdale, which was lack of housing. Um, so David put a quote from Upstairs in the Crazy House from Pat Pony's book, but I want to just read, because I think we've got time, um, a little, uh, some more excerpts from her book. Most of the boarding houses are enormously large. If you're on welfare, you're allowed two, three, four, five to a room. Most of the places don't have a dresser. Generally, if you get one blanket, which is, you, generally you get one blanket, which is kind of threadbare, and it gets cold in those houses because they're old and the heat doesn't rise in the winter. The bathroom is shared by nine or 10 people. There's a central dining room with institutional type tables and chairs. Sometimes there's a TV room, two couches. Sometimes it's a little bit more elaborate, three couches. <laughs> A lot, a lot of places don't have proper smoke detectors and fire extinguishers. How can you feel very good living there? You feel as if the world has really written you off. You know it in everyone's face when they look at you or don't. And you know it when people are walking by and staring at your house. Thank you. Brent. 
So you will have uh, figured out by now that we're speaking metaphorically often. And in this case, house link is a metaphor for an attempt to create a form of housing that might be better. And in this case, it's called supported housing. And Houselink was one of the first organizations off the mark. It was actually started by two social workers at the Queen Street Mental Health Center in 1976. And what they did was they rented several houses and they pooled everybody's welfare check to pay the rent. And uh, they tried to ensure that that housing was less crowded and less horrible than the housing that they were replacing. And eventually, House Link was able to buy property and build property of its own. And it's almost, uh, let me see, 35 years on now, and it has about 400 units. Uh, perhaps the most dramatic takeover that House Link ever pulled off was the takeover of Shannon Court, the notorious rooming house that Pat Capone lived in. And that happened in the mid 80s, a little bit after about 86, 87, I think, if I recall. And uh, not everybody was happy about it. Actually, Pat Capone was kind of unhappy about it um, because she wasn't sure that uh, social housing providers would be that much better than anybody else. Um, notwithstanding that, and I think if, if Pat were here, she would, she might shake her head a bit because she was on the founding board, as was I, of the Supportive Housing Coalition in 1981, which is by far the largest supportive housing organization in uh, Toronto. It has almost a thousand units today. And uh, uh, Pat would argue, as she did in a 1998 Now magazine article, that uh, what happened as community mental health was developed was that social workers got jobs and that mad people stayed poor. And, uh, and that is true, of course. That, that is what did happen. Uh, although I, I, uh, I don't begrudge anybody a decent wage for doing it on a stage work, for sure. Um, what else was we going to talk about? Um, blah, 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 and blah. Talk about habitat services. Oh, yeah. Uh, one, one of the uh, other uh, attempted solutions was to try and get private boarding and lodging house operators to offer a better product, uh, better food, uh, smaller number of people uh, sharing rooms. Instead of three to a room, how about two to a room? Uh, perhaps a little recreation activity. So a organization called Habitat Services was formed and it just had its 20th anniversary, no, 1987, blah, 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 2007. Holy smokes, 13. 25 years, I guess. Um, and it actually provides a per diem to a private boarding and lodging house operator if the operator meets a particular standard of care. And I think they have about 900 rooms in the portfolio, and about 500 of them are here in Parkdale. So that was another attempt at trying to improve what was already happening, which was a private sector response to uh, the need for affordable housing uh, uh, by people who didn't had hardly any money. So that was that solution. And if we have the next slide, oh, Oh, this actually relates to the housing story. Um, that is a Xerox copy of a snapshot that was on my bulletin board for about 30 years. And uh, we had created a tent city at Queen's Park. And in 1981, you could actually do that without getting arrested. That's not true now, I'm sorry to tell you. And we were protesting the then Minister of Health, Dennis Timbrell, who said, after I let them out of the hospital, I, they've got nothing to do with me anymore. Do you want me to put a leash on them? And uh, we were protesting for better housing, and that's, uh, you can see the active person in this photograph is Pat Capone. She's at the podium there with an excellent hat. 
Next to her, wearing his Trotsky hat, is Mel Starkman, who is uh, one of the founders of the Psychiatric Survivor Archives of Toronto. Next to him is somebody from the South American Junta. And next to him is Tyrone Turner, who uh, is now the psychiatrist in chief at uh, St. Joe's Hospital. And next to him is a young city councillor who would be me. Uh, okay, next. And this is the slide about Parkdale Community Legal Services about which we don't have time to talk. Next. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but we have to make time to talk about the cuckoo's nest because we think that the cuckoo's nest was the closest thing to a true voice of madness here in Parkdale. Um, the Cuckoo's Nest started publishing in November 1979, and there was, shortly after that, in 1980, Phoenix Rising, which I referenced earlier in the talk, um, the psych newspaper came out, but they were very different, oh, thank you. Um, they were very different publications because um, as I said, Phoenix Rising was a much broad, had a much broader a remit. Um, was a much was a national or international uh, publication, though it was based here in Toronto. But the Nest, as Pack Pony called it, was intensely local. It dealt with local issues here in Parkdale from a map perspective. And this library actually has a pretty good collection of um, of uh, cuckoo's nests. If anyone wants to look at them. You have to ask. Um, Pat Capone was the editor. Uh, John Thane, David Milne, Mike Johnson also took that role. Um, and Cameron Stewart, Linda McKenzie, and someone called Eve are listed as additional staff members. By September 1980, they had 21 contributors uh, listed on their masthead. And they published um, for six years on and off, Pat Capone told me. If so, I could interject. I think Pat was lured by the silver screen because she began to do the cuckoo's nest on television. On uh, Shaw Cable, is that what you used to have in this neighborhood? And she did a monthly live uh, cable show that was fabulous. Yeah. 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 Sorry. Well, no, that's okay. That's okay. I forgot about that back. point. Okay. Uh, so Capone's vision for the cuckoo's nest, I think, was motivated by her early apprenticeship in Montreal um, in student politics and student journalism and she wanted she had kind of a dual purpose for the cuckoo's nest one um, that she didn't really emphasize when I interviewed her but I think one one was uh, to alleviate some of the distrust and unease that had characterized local attitudes of long-term residents towards ex-patients in Parkdale um, so she says in her first editorial, we want to acquaint you with our element of society. Um, but the a second purpose was to politicize Parkdale site survivors, um, to motivate them to become active activists and to foster change with starting here in Parkdale. Um, and again, I'm quoting from an early editorial. We're not leaving here. She's taking the activist voice. We won't be driven away again. We're here. We want to live too. We want peace. We want acceptance. We want you to hear us, to know us. And if you won't help us, we want you to let us be. Okay, so. So that is that. that's the part where I'm to do something cool? Yeah. The good, bad. The good news, okay. bad news. Okay, could we have a slide there, Brent? Oh, this is the Mad Pride Parade. This happens to be a 2007 picture. And, and you see the little logo with the brain lifting the balloon? And that's a good story there. Uh, I teach a history of madness at Ryerson, and one of my students asked for some activist activity she could do. So I sent her to join the organizing committee for the Mad Pride Parade. And she designed this logo, which, by the way, is now used worldwide. Uh, by Mad Pride in Ghana and uh, eight other countries in the world. So I think that's too cool for school. Uh, <laughs> next slide. Uh, okay, this is a group of mad activists on their way to the Dream Team dinner last April. And you can see that we were lucky to uh, have our friend Pakatoni with us. 
And I put an arrow pointing to the large man on the left, whose name is Jeremiah. And I just want you to know that Jeremiah is a mad student, and he now works as a peer support worker at Archway. So the world turns, ladies and gentlemen, and sometimes it gets better. Next. Okay, so there is a big conversation going on in the country, and it's about mental health. It's such a big conversation that even you can even get a stamp that uh, is to support mental health. And you can see their first stamp didn't quite make it. The person with the arrow through his head, <laughs> that, that arrow through that guy's head was making him feel so crazy. So they replaced it with this lady with the megaphone. I'm not quite sure what that means. Uh, but you can buy those stamps and part of the money goes to fund mental health programs. And I think the Bell Telephone Company has just popped on this new cause wagon. And they are going to be raising money for mental health as well. Next. Oh, yes. Well, uh, there is an extremely well-funded national exercise to discuss mental health. The Mental Health Commission of Canada. And they have a truly elegant website. And uh, you can go on that website and see really nice people talking about how they overcame their mental health problem. And you can see very highly paid researchers discuss the highly paid research they are doing, including research into the vexing question, does having housing, is having housing good for your mental health or is it okay to be homeless? Um, the other picture is the cover of an Ontario government document that has an encouraging title, Navigating the Journey to Wellness, the Comprehensive Mental Health and Addictions Action Plan for Ontario. And that has been put together by an all-party committee of the legislature and is now before the House. Uh, and it has a plan to fix the whole thing, too. And part of the plan is really bad. Uh, part of the work that the Mental Health Commission is doing is needs to be challenged. It is absolutely medical in its orientation. But because we're having both a national and a provincial conversation, you can get in on it. And uh, if you think that having a decent place to live and enough money to live on and something to do and an opportunity for social inclusion is good for people, then you need to tell these folks. You need to tell the Mental Health Commission that and you need to tell the Ontario legislature that because they don't seem to be knowing that too well. Um, do we have any more in there? Yes, we're going to come to that in a second because this is also very good. Um, let, me, let me say this. Uh, you know because you've walked through the neighborhood. Parkdale is gentrifying. That is going to put pressure on the remaining boarding and lodging houses. Uh, the owners of those lodging houses may be tempted to sell and cash in on gentrification. What will become of those people? Um, it won't be like the last time. It won't be like the 70s because they'll go down a few at a time and those poor people are going to go to God knows where. And they may end up in a place that has no resources at all because there's still plenty of places like that. Uh, so... On the one hand, the deinstitutionalizing experiment may almost be over for Parkdale. But it's not almost over by a long shot for the people who are the victims of it. And uh, we still have a situation where people are discharged from hospital with a disability check and a prescription, and that just won't do. And now you can tell us something good. This is good. Well, yes, this is good. This is part, these are some of the projects that the uh, History of Madness website is involved with. Um, one of them, the Caring Minds project, is for high school students. Um, it's uh, a series of multidisciplinary teaching units. That's good. Yeah. I think the uh, Open Doors, Closed Ranks, the 
deinstitutionalization project that we're working on is good and we're hoping to do get some teaching modules and teaching materials for professional programs in social work and nursing occupational therapy and god only knows maybe medicine um out of that project to teach people who are going to be working professionally um with mad people a little bit of the history of deinstitutionalization um so those are those are good things website. and the website <coughs> uh historymadness.ca is where you can find us those are good stories you were going to talk about no i just i just want to use oh. this moment to recognize the inventor of mad studies uh, jeffrey rayon is right there hi jeff thank you for coming um Jeffrey pioneered a course called Mad People's History at Ryerson in 2002. And he now teaches that course at the graduate level at York University. And I inherited his spot at Ryerson, so I'm very grateful and my grandchildren thank you. <laughs> uh, I'm also really excited that two universities in this country have courses called Mad People's History because it is extremely unusual. And colleagues of mine around the world are really jealous of us here in Toronto that we have this kind of uh, uh knowledge available to students. Okay, well we have now two options. We can you can talk about OCAB and Green Thumb or we could just have um No, why don't we have some questions because okay. uh, if you're interested in what's going on at the Ontario Council of Al Alternative Businesses which is upstairs in Vic Willis's crazy house, um go on their website uh they're doing some really interesting stuff including uh creating knowledge work for people with mental health histories uh they have a consulting company um they're also working with local 75 the hotel workers on creating a social enterprise for hotel workers and this is all knowledge generated by the mad community so that's really exciting to see happening but i like to spend how many minutes You've been listening to a recording of Megan Davies and David Revell's presentation, Locating Parkdale's Mad History: Back Wards to Back Streets, 1980 to 2010. Check out the podcast section of activehistory.ca for recordings of other talks from the History Matters lecture series.